Hey everybody, this is Neil Pasricha, and before we begin, just a little note. Uh, as I record this message, the world is burning. There are hospitals that are full, that are turning people away. There are countries screaming for help, begging for metal, medical supplies and intubators and medicine from anybody who will listen, who's able to provide resources, schools, sports, hospitals, everything is shutting down. The economy is collapsing. Stocks are dive bombing. People are scrambling. And I, like many of you, are feeling that stress, uh, that anxiety, and that just dread in my stomach, in my heart. Every single thing that I was supposed to be doing this month in March of 2020, every single thing has been canceled. Every trip, every conference, every speech, every book, book event, every PR event, everything. I wondered if we should pause three books, if we should change three books, if we could, if we should, how, how could we address these issues, which undoubtedly affect many of our listeners around the world. And then I zoomed up and I thought about 1000awesomethings.com, the blog I wrote from 2008 to 2012. I started that blog during a tough time in my life, but also a tough time in the world's life as so many tumultuous news events were all happening all at once. I created that space, that blog, as an escape from my everyday, as an alternate reality, as a place where I could be out of the world while remaining inside the world. I have pledged to you and to myself to publish a new chapter of three books on the exact minute of every single full moon and every single new moon from March 2018 all the way up to September 1st, 2031, counting down 1,000 of the world's most formative books. And I'm going to keep doing that. I hope for some of you, the show provides an escape. For others, it provides an alternate home, an alternate headspace. I know many times over the next few months, maybe a few years, it will feel that way for me. And I'm sure, depending on what's happening in your personal life, it could hopefully feel that way to you. Of course, what's happening now will alter the reality that we live in. It may alter conversations. It will alter probably guests that we have. Um, but I am pledging to myself and to you to keep our train running, to keep our conversation going about books. If at times the content appears tone deaf to what's happening in the world around us, uh, two things. One, some of these conversations were recorded before all the news is happening. And also, I'm going to try to keep the show as a safe space and as a bit of a secret mental home where all of us can connect and be together every single new moon and every single full moon for many, many more years. I'm thinking of you. I'm feeling your pain, your love, and our connection. Um, keep giving me feedback. Give me a call at one eight three three read lot and let's keep going with the show. Everybody, this is Neil Pasricha, and welcome, or welcome back, to chapter 50 of Three Books. Yes, you are listening to our epic 14-year-long countdown to uncover and discuss the world's 1,000 most formative books, three books at a time. 
We are doing this show 100% ad-free, commercial-free, sponsor-free, interruption-free. We're doing every single chat live and in person, sitting down with guests in the place of their choice. We don't have a studio. I got a backpack, so I go wherever the guest wants me to go. And we are, as far as we know, the only show in the entire world exclusively by and for book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians. Who are we talking to? Well, we're talking to people like former sex worker Juniper Fitzgerald. We met up with her in the Omaha, Nebraska airport back in chapter 31 of the show. Juniper told us how she came to develop and write and publish the very first children's book in the entire world featuring a sex working parent. Where else have we hung out? Well, we've hung out in Hollywood. Yes, we have been to Hollywood, people, where we sat down with the legendary comic Pete Holmes, author of the phenomenal memoir Comedy Sex God, where we uncovered Pete Holmes's, 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 uh, Pete Holmes's three most formative books. Where have we been most recently? Well, we have been most recently at the Sherborne Health Center in downtown Toronto, sitting down with Dr. Andrea Sereda award-winning Dr. Andrea Sereda, who, in her words, gives drugs to drug users. A huge conversation about whether or not drugs should be criminalized at all, and what their criminalization, in fact, actually does for the drugs and the people in our society that are most susceptible to the drugs. That was a fascinating conversation. And now where are we going? Well, we are going to Vancouver. No, I don't live in Vancouver, and no, Marcus Buckingham, my guest in this chapter, does not live in Vancouver. So why are we in Vancouver? Well, because Marcus Buckingham was the headline speaker at a series of events across Canada and the U.S. called The Art of Leadership. I was lucky enough to be in his dark shadows on the stage. He was the headliner. He was the big, big name. And I was lucky enough to share the stage with him. So eventually I worked up the courage to ask Marcus, hey, before our last ever event together, would you mind like coming over to my hotel room where I can come to yours? And and could you tell me about your three most formative books? He was like, sure. So he did. So this conversation takes place in room, I think it's room 1107 in the Fairmont waterfront overlooking the the foggy mountains of British Columbia before Marcus took the stage at the Art of Leadership event. Who is Marcus? Who is Marcus Buckingham? Well, if you're in the corporate world or the business world, uh, you probably heard of this guy. Why? Because he's a global researcher. He's a thought leader focused on focusing, focused, focusing, focused. Well, I guess he's focusing and focused on unlocking strengths. That's his big thing. Strengths, increasing performance and pioneering the future of how people work. He is the author of two of the best-selling business books of all time called First Break All the Rules and then Now Discover Your Strengths and his most recent book, Nine Lies About Work, A Free Thinking Leader's Guide to the Real World, which he co-wrote uh, with Ashley Goodall, and which came out in 2019. How did he become Marcus Buckingham? How do you go to writing these big, big articles and books and headlining gigantic events? Well, here's how you do it. You spend two decades as senior researcher inside the Gallup organization. You've heard of Gallup. They're in the bottom right-hand corner of every single screen on TV. Source, Gallup, source, Gallup, source, Gallup. This is a gigantic research company. This guy is senior researcher there. Now what does he do? He was there He was there for two decades. Now what does he do? Well, he guides the vision of ADP Research Institute as head of people and performance. And in 2006, he founded the Marcus Buckingham Company with the clear mission to instigate a strengths revolution. I love the optimism behind his work, that people are born as acorns with an imprint inside them on what they could be, what their truest potential could lead them to. Marcus's work helps people bring out their biggest and truest potential using their strengths to achieve great results. So what do we talk about? Well, we talk about a lot of things. Uh, we talk about how we truly see our children. How can we truly see our children? What are some of the risks of that? how the education system can be improved to see the uniqueness of each child, what the real definition of weird is, and how we find our own unique way to draw strength and love from life. 
Marcus also was brave and vulnerable in this conversation. I would not have asked him about it otherwise, but he had just released a video before we sat down at this hotel room of him talking about how his ex-wife was caught up in the college admissions scandal, which, of course, uh, affected his children. So we go into that as well and think about how that's related to some of our conversations about parenting and about believing in our children and what we do to create or remove agency from our child, our children. I think it was I caught him pretty fresh on this topic. I wouldn't have sort of brought it up if he hadn't have brought it up, but you'll hear some of us talking about that in here. Okay, what else we talk about? Well, his three most formative books, of course. And without further ado, let's get into it now. Okay, great. I, I said play, but I meant record. I just, play, just press record. It's your first okay. time doing this? Yeah, it's my, I, I, it always feels like my first time. I double check the recording's working every time. So we are currently posing for a photo on a, on a classic hotel couch, room 1003 at the Fairmont Waterfront. Uh, overlooking, I think it's supposed to be the mountains, but you can't quite see them because they're foggy. It feels very much like um, like the uh, um, those vampire movies when they all filmed on Vancouver Island. They were right, yeah. The Mist, Twilight. You're talking Twilight. I yeah. love that you know that. <laughs> well, they're vampire. Movies. And then, do you spend much time up in Vancouver? I know you live. You're in California. I'm in LA, but. Yeah. Um, I've been here a fair bit. Yes, we've done some work over the years with with Lululemon, who's up here, and uh, we've uh, had they've got some good event space, which is where you and I are going to be this afternoon. Um, and then uh, I've got some friends up here, so we've sort of we've done some interesting stuff. Uh, I went to Vancouver Island to look at um, some schools there and what they're doing with strengths in schools, which was interesting. So I haven't spent a ton of time here, but enough time to be memorable. Yeah. If we could take that little lead in and jump into them. I'd love to just give our listeners a brief overview of each of these books. And then Marcus, I'll ask you just to tell us your relationship with them. Sure. So we can kind of pro poke and prod them from there. Intimate History, History of Humanity. The Intimate History of Humanity by Theodore Zeldin from Stinkler Stevenson in 1994. Theodore Zeldin was born August 22nd, 1933, an Oxford scholar and thinker whose books have searched for answers to three questions. Where can a person look to find more inspiring ways of spending each day and each year? What ambitions remain unexplored beyond happiness, prosperity, love, faith, technology, and therapy? And what role could there be for individuals with independent minds who feel isolated or different or misfits? File this one, Dewey Decimal Heads, and 128 for Humankind. It covers a blue background with gold letters, an image of four women dressed up in old-fashioned gowns, tossing a man into the air. Now continue with your relationship with loneliness, because it's you write the, the first book nice, nicely dovetails into some of these themes. So Theodore Zeldin is uh, an expert on the French, actually. Um, his first three books were all about the French. And um, he then sort of moves into this book, which is called An Intimate History of Humanity. I like it for two reasons. Well, for a million reasons. But one of them is he is an observer of the real world. So he begins every chapter with a little profile, a short profile of a different French woman. Each chapter begins. Now, you could skip it as a reader, but he begins with a little miniature, like a little portrait of Tracy. Mm -hmm. And we get to learn about Tracy. She yeah. might be a um, a super high-powered insurance executive. She might be a maid in a, uh, a house in Paris. She might be a shopkeeper in Toulouse. Um, she might be super sad. She might be going through depression. Like, who knows what? Each one of them is different. And so each chapter begins that way, and it's a real person. So I love um, his approach to anything he's writing about is primary qualitative research. Mm -hmm. He's not sitting around going, well, I think, well, I... He's actually going... I'm out doing primary qualitative psychological and anthropological research, which is awesome because it means that you're driving your conclusions from the real world. Yeah. Um, quite a lot of us don't do that. We write books because we sit around and we just noodle. Yes. And there's value to just Why noodling. are you looking at me when you say that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, I think we do, right? There's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of like, uh, I'm just sitting around. He's out there 
And I began my career at Gallup doing focus groups and then interviews, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of interviews, where you have a set load of questions that are open-ended and you, and you tape record every interview and you mm -hmm. transcribe it. And I've poured over, like many of the other researchers at Gallup, where I worked for the first decade or so of my career, you're pouring over interviews of a human, one person, no simplistic um, um, oversimplifications about a person's uh, race or gender or age. You're talking about a particular human, and it's flipping fascinating to ask questions of a particular human and realize that all of your generalizations about gender or race or age or nationality are all horribly... Um, uh, they, they blind you to the beautiful uniqueness of that person and the massive... Um, uh, inconsistencies and yeah. contradictions that live inside one human. Um, it's like the old typology stuff, where in extrovert, introvert, and you interview someone, you go, no, you're a bit of this and a bit of that, yeah. but you're also weird over here and you're strange over here. And you. Um, so Theodore Zeldin does that. He starts the N of one. I mean, there's a beauty to the N of one. Mm -hmm. And each chapter begins with a one. And you're like, it's just, it's just a beautiful approach to um, research. Yeah. You and, do this. Well, I, I think I've, I resonated with what he did. Mm -hmm. I actually learned it, this approach from, from Don Clifton, who was the chairman of Gallup and yes. the, one of the sort of grandfathers of positive psychology. And, and Don was always like, just shut up and interview people and tape record it and transcribe it. And who knows what you'll find. And when you do an awful lot of that, your generalizations just begin to look increasingly like um, a mask, which prevents you from seeing the world as it truly is. So that approach to research is just beautiful, honorable, respectful. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that for those people that like that as readers. That it's the you, opposite of how we want to function in the world. We're just sifting and sorting everybody into quick categories. Right. And being able to navigate it because you're this way and I'm that way. And Demographics, and, and, psychographics. Yeah. Programming on G TV. Gen X, Millennial, Gen Y. I'm right. always asked about this question. How do these people differ from those people? It's just like there's a lot of that in the world today. This is an yes. antithesis of that. Well, it is really. It's like you looking at your three sons mm -hmm. and somebody going, well, they're all Gen, whatever the next Gen is. They're yes, all exactly. you know, Gen Viral or whatever yeah. the next one well, will be. after Z. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe whatever, back to Gen A. A. Anyway, Gen, well, they're all Gen A. <laughs> and, um, and then you go to them. They're my three boys. Let me tell you about each one of them. And each story would be so weird and different and unique, and it would be true. So uh, there are, I'm not saying all generalizations yeah. are um, obscuring, but certainly reading Zeldin's book, you start, and he, he did it so deliberately. Each chapter, you know, in a sense, he's waving a flag going, be careful that we do not generalize about what I'm about to write about because, because Marie-Louise, and then you read about Marie-Louise. Um, so I love that. Then, of course, all the way through, this is an intimate history of humanity. So the chapters are so short, but they're all on subjects that you go, what? And so like, one of the chapters was something like, why? Here's all the chapter titles. Okay. No, In case that's no, helpful, no, too. That's so helpful. Okay, so this one, um, uh, how respect has become more desirable than power. That's interesting. But there are they're, they're chapters like, why there has been more progress in cooking than in sex. Yeah. And you're like, what is that chapter going to be about? And so his each one has got something like That's that where you before go... before BuzzFeed. <laughs> right. Um, why toleration has never been enough. You're like, well, I've never seen those words written in that way. I've never seen that word combination. Mm -hmm. What is that chapter about? Because I've never seen those seven words written in that way. So the, the whole framing is lovely in that. We're just framing a question going, wait, what? Why toleration has never been enough? Um, why friendships between men and women have been so fragile? Like, wait, what, 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 what? So I love that. And then the whole book anchored for me around one idea, which is he explores beautifully. And the idea, if you go back to that chapter title, which is chapter 15, why toleration has never been enough, is that... Um, we aren't curious enough about each other. Toleration in that chapter, as I recall it, is is bad because it's distancing. Tolerance is terrible. We now intolerance is worse, but tolerance is about distance and separateness. And the whole book really says we just aren't curious about each other. We need way more empathy, way more questions, way more interactions. We need 
we need that because from that comes um, comes sympathy, comes mm -hmm. empathy, comes a sharing of experience, comes a walking in someone else's moccasins, all of that, where you're like, wow, this is a different experience than my life. But when we tolerate one another, and yes, we should rail against intolerance, of course, but the opposite of intolerance isn't tolerance. The opposite of intolerance should be curiosity. Mm. And so the whole book is about, in a sense, it's a primer on how to be curious about each other. Wow. And that's really lovely in a world where today we don't practice curiosity very mm -hmm. much. And if you're not curious, you can't be empathetic. How do you build curiosity? And your, your dad, again, let's go back to this, or, or you're, you're in front of people. How do you, is this a skill we can build in others? How? how? The book is obviously one tool. It's a, pri it's a prima. Is it prima or prima? Primer. Primer. I like prima if that was a go if that was the word used on curiosity, building curiosity. Here in Canada, what 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 do we say to be curious? Yeah. Do, yeah. We, do we say prima or do we say prima? I don't know. I, I... prima. Tracy's looking over at me and <laughs> saying primer. Uh, but I would like to, we always at the end of every chapter of the show have a word of the chapter, which is a word that the guest uses that I don't understand. In many cases, it's many words, but that might be the word of the chapter. We'll say David Sedaris used the word Lilliputian on me. Out of nowhere, I was like, Lilla, what? He's like, I was referred to as thumb-sized. You said, um, so a couple things here. Can we build curiosity? Let's talk about that. And the second thing is, and I want to be sensitive of time, mm. you know, you said you said about five minutes ago, I think. Remember you were getting to answer that question about loneliness? Yes. I think. And then I interrupted by injecting the book. So just take one of those two roads, Marcus. You can go down either one you want. So if you read this book... You, are, you become aware that the point of everything is, is to honor the humanity of oneself and those around you. That's why we're here. Mm -hmm. We're here to do stuff together. 85% of people do most of their work on teams, as one example. No one, very few people, are in a shed at the bottom of the garden all by themselves, relying on no one, connected to no one. Now, the loneliness statistics you quoted earlier suggest that people may feel that way. Mm -hmm. But the way that we live our lives, we are connected to our families, to our communities. So the point of us is to engage with others. We are a, we are a herd animal. That's what we're wired to do, to see other humans and figure out how we can live help. Live in tribes. Them. Exactly. We live in tribes. Um, and if we have uh, problems today, it's because we've built companies, we've built cities as though this isn't true. Like you look at many big cities with their huge blocks, mm -hmm. with very little interaction and and Even the difference. word gated, that phrase, yeah. gated yeah. community. It's all about separation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also about transaction. I mean, you look at most companies today and they really are just extensions of the 1914 Ford assembly line. Where you, you go to most healthcare establishments and, and, and it's not the car that's moving through the assembly line, it's the patient. Mm -hmm. And there's no teams and each nurse is one nurse supervisor to 70 nurses. And we wonder why nurses have higher levels of PTSD than the vets that come back from the from, from Afghanistan or, or Iraq. And you're like, we've, we've built companies as though humans don't need to connect to one another. And we've built society sort of in that way too. And as a result, we aren't curious of one another. We aren't intrigued. We don't bump in to, we don't um, really have the occasion to. Mm -hmm. We're missing a lot of metaphorical water coolers. Mm. And so it, as a solution, there are so many different mechanisms. I mean, you, if, you, if you read uh, another great book, um, uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Jane Jacobs? Jane, Jane, Jane Jacobs. Toronto, Toronto uh, it, resident where right? I live. Ah. Yeah, yeah, from New York, but um, lived in Toronto for most of her late, late years. You know, so she fought against uh, Roy Cohn on mm -hmm. pre preserving Greenwich Village because it has a function. And the function it has is, is human-sized. It's human-sized. And we don't build cities for human-sized. We don't build schools for child-sized. We don't build companies for human-sized. We build them for, for big uh, transactions and, and monumental efficiency, which isn't terrible. I'm not saying that that, that the assembly line wasn't a good advance over the cotton mills of Manchester or whatever in the 1860s. So there's been, I mean, there, were, there were some improvements. And yet really for the last hundred years, certainly in education and in healthcare and in work, we really just have taken the assembly line and squeezed the living daylights out of it. Mm. Total quality management, business process engineering, lean, like it's all just simply taken the same, um, uh, you know, efficiency is king. 
and squeezing that till the nth degree. And what you lose is you lose um, humanity. You lose the humans in it. And so we don't bump into one another and we don't have the occasion to ask one another questions or directions. And that, that how, how do we tilt against that? I think you've got to start with the core beliefs that you're approaching these things with. Uh, is each one of us precious and important? Is each one of us worthy of respect? If you're not starting with that, then you build a school system or an education system or a work system that basically is designed as though humans weren't humans, which sounds like it's a polemic or I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it, it isn't. I mean, you were quoting those loneliness statistics. I can quote you engagement statistics yeah. that show that 84, 85% of people around the world are just coming to work, Yeah, which I'm sure companies wouldn't want, mm -hmm. but they've actually designed the way that they do work as though it's almost inevitable. Yes. So I think you have to start with your belief systems. Is each human, is each child, you have three boys, you are going to throw them into the Canadian school system. And despite the really good intentions, the system itself is designed not to see them. It's weird. And say as a mom, more, say more, open that up. It's, it's not designed to, to reveal the uniqueness of mm -hmm. your child. Mm -hmm. The school system is set up to produce people that can contribute to a capitalist economy. That's what it was set up to do. And it does it not badly. Um, but it wasn't designed to go, who's your five-year-old? What's he into? What's he drawn to? How does he build relationships? Inquisitive How do you think? Learning, like, yeah. well, like mm -hmm. who the heck are you? Mm -hmm. It's not designed to do that. It's designed actually to go, there's because nothing inside your kid. Because one teacher has to teach 30 kids. Right, but that doesn't necessarily mean that good teaching isn't about individualization. Mm -hmm. It is. What's the what? Why is class size too big at thirty? Although some, by the way, some t teachers could probably individualize with thirty. Some teachers struggle to individualize with six. But what we haven't done is said the point of education is to help a child to discover what his or her unique gifts are, mm -hmm. and then to contribute those or other to to refine those intelligently with education, um, training, learning. We that's not the that's not the point. It's like going to work and going, shouldn't the point be, the entire point should be that work should be for love. Mm -hmm. Like that idea, that the point of work is to discover that which you love. Yes. If you say it that way, somebody's going to go, well, that's so stupid. No, no, work is for contribution and output. But you go, no, no, work is for creativity, performance, engagement, courage, resilience, openness. That's what you want from your best employees. That's what you want. From, that's what everybody's writing about. That's what every CEO says they want. Well, you don't get any of those things. If you don't find deep love in what you do, I don't mean that you have to love the entirety of your job. That's unrealistic. But if you don't find love in what you do, you won't get any of those things. Mm -hmm. So why would we make the entire point of work to find that which you love? Now, it could be a journey. You can scavenge a hunt over the course of your career. But that should be the point. Same with your kids in the Canadian education system. The entire flipping point of sending your kids to school should be not to get them into the right school, the right university, or the right job. That's not the point. The point should be, who's that kid? What's your son's name who's five? Hudson. Hudson. What's Hudson into? What's Hudson about? Mm -hmm. What's Hudson Dent in the world? You know who really cares about that? Hudson. Mm -hmm. And school should be an enabler of Hudsonness. Mm -hmm. And it isn't. Yeah. If it happens, it will be because you and your wife, or partner, will be curious about him. Yeah. But it won't be because the system is set up to be curious about him. Right. As weird as that sounds to say, and I'm not yeah. saying there aren't some amazing teachers. No, no, no. Your emotional energy just went up, like, over the last few minutes. You, you, you're you using your arms a lot more. Your eyes are moist. And um, you used a phrase right there. You know, the whole point isn't to get into the right schools. I just watched that video you posted. Oh, yeah. You, you posted it, right? The video I never thought I'd, yeah. I'd share. You said, my life has been cleaved in two. You talked about that. Yeah. Well, that was, yeah, I, I got, I am denied about posting that at all. But um, as I said in the video, last year, well, I guess not last year, earlier this year, the college scandal in the US broke. I'm divorced, but my ex-wife, who is a really good human, did something really, really hurtful to my son. And I think did it with like tremendously good intentions. Like every mother, every father, if you thought I could just give them a leg up. And she um, engaged with this person, Rick Singer, to the tune of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, not just to have someone correct his ACT results, but to have someone take the entire test for him. Um, and the funny thing is that when he took it the first time in the US, you can take the ACT test a number of times. Mm -hmm. The first time he took it, 
proctored at school, you know, blah, blah, blah. The kid was in the 94th percentile, which with his grades and so on, is, is, he would have plenty of choice. But that wasn't enough. Somehow that wasn't enough. And so uh, this is sort of part of the capitalistic race, I think, where you go, it's just not enough. I've got to get more. I need an edge. I need an edge. And I'm not saying that all parents, myself included, we are all in a sense part of that problem where we turn our children into assets in a competitive sport. Um, and we've all done a bit of that. Um, who hasn't helped with homework? Who sometimes has done homework? Who hasn't put the bumper sticker? Building the volcano. Right, right. You know, and you put the bumper sticker, proud parent of an honor student, you know? So your, pa- your kids are chips that you have on the, on, the, on the poker tables of life. And we've all sort of done, done a bit of that. And yet when you push on, on that, what you realize is what you're doing, and obviously the college cheating scandal was egregious and illegal and an extreme version of it. But what you're doing is you're not, this is what I said in the, in the piece, you're not seeing your child. And that image of the Pac-Man parent, and, you, and you're moving your piece around the board and, and, and getting the fruit and getting the next level. And of course, the kid didn't get to the next level. You got the kid to the next level. And that means that the kid has no agency. Mm. You haven't seen Hudson. Yeah. So for me, it is, it, we're going to be creating a standout assessment, which is the strengths assessment that I built. And we're going to make one for kids uh, because so many parents come to us and say, my kid's 11, 12, 13, 14. I don't know what his or her strengths are. And uh, I want to create one that is really simple, really coherent. We've had more than a million people take standout. Obviously, we've got a strength finder, but that's a different sort of assessment. Um, But I wanted to create standout student and then give it away. Mm. Just give it away, Mm -hmm. which we will do. And to some extent... I was going to do it anyway, but yeah. the, the fact that this college cheating thing yeah. happened and that my son was caught up in it yeah. and that it took me a while to even figure out what I could say on the subject. Um, Why? I, it, oh, just because your first responsibility is to protect your kids. Mm. Don't say it. So don't. Yeah. So they're victims. Mm-hmm. So you go, my first job here is to, is yeah. to turn the volume down on yes. it because yeah. all they want and you also are so um, public, right? Well, uh, most people probably weren't aware that my that, that that was Jack. I mean, I you know I talk about Jack a lot in my in my books, in my speeches, and so that's Jack, right? Um, but probably twenty percent of people were, and I didn't feel like it was in the end. I guess where I came to Neil was that I didn't feel it was respectful to the people that had been with me since first break all the rules. Mm-hmm. It wasn't respectful to say nothing. Yeah, I certainly wasn't going to, um, you know, say critical things of um, of Jack's mom, Jane, because that wasn't that doesn't seem right. So it was for me my way of moving through life is to try to make sense of things, and for a long time I don't think I had any sense to make of it, and it was only after about seven months that I was like, okay, the only sense I can pull from this is how do you make space to see your child? Mm -hmm. And that what this scandal was an extreme version of was not seeing your child and kind of not wanting to. And so if I'm going to take anything away from this, I thought it would be good to share what I'm going to try to take away with the people that have been with me for for 20 years and I think so it's brave to do that you po- you know you talked about it publicly you posted a video and then how do you navigate forward from this now how do you go forward you you um, you your ex your children um next year the year after how, how do you move through it well it's hard i mean it, these things will take a while for for the kids to figure out mm. the kids have got to figure out their relationship with their mom yeah and mm. i'm not going to interfere with that mm. um they're going to have to figure that out for themselves. I think for me personally, I can do things in this space and go, there's tools that we can build that we can help with. So giving a, yeah. a tool set. You that, have a natural uh, strength yeah. <laughs> in this world. So you can, you can go, it, it, it provokes you. You said your life has been cleaved in half and so, two. So now you, now you have the energy yeah. that comes from the, the sort of going through the cr- crucible we, moment. We've been, we've been talking about doing strengths in schools for mm-hmm. so long. Yeah. When I was up here on Vancouver Island, yes, to look you just at, mentioned, right? yeah. 
strengths in schools and how people, they would take, um, this was because we, we made a video in 2006 called Trombone Player Wanted, which was yes, a, which was a short film series. Yep. And um, we did it for grownups. And then out of the blue, somebody called and said, uh, hi, I'm a middle school teacher. I just want to take kind of your permission to take the first video of the Trombone Player Wanted film series and turn it into a year long curriculum for kids. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but that, they're going to be, it's not for them. Yeah. And, but I said, sure. And then put down the phone and forgot about it. And a year later, the teacher called back and said, hey, look, we got like a thousand or so kids in this school and they're all uh, deep into this strength stuff when you want to come have a look. And so we actually, me and Tracy went and you're like, you get there. It was, it was pajama day that day. <laughs> and you get there and there's thousands of kids in pajamas. And then they all seem to have seen trombone play wanted. They know all the words about what a strength is, what it isn't. And they've created this curriculum and it's now grown into something more. But it began as... Um, uh, every kid got a cardboard box. Mm. And the whole point of the class for the f entire year was this is your voice box and it starts empty. You're 11, 12 years old. You may be struggling with truancy. You may be struggling with grades. You may just be struggling with being a teenager. Who knows what? We're going to try and keep you in school because we want you to have a voice. And so you start, they, go, they gave them a cardboard box and they gave them one of these little flip phones and then said, every kid in the class has got to just record their answer to the question, when was the last time a day flew by? Mm. When was the last time? By the way, you know the answer it's to that. It's a great question. It's a great question, right? Mm -hmm. And no kid has the wrong answer to that question. They've all got different answers, but the teacher doesn't know the answer. So they started off with that lovely question, when was the last time a day flew by? And then they would share that with the class. And then gradually, as the year went on, they would put specific things that strengthened them, that invigorated them, that they lent into, whether it was playing the guitar or drawing a cartoon. They would, they would put it in the box. So you go in the classroom and the boxes at the bottom were kind of empty and brown. But then as you looked up on the shelves, as the kind of year had gone on with some of the students, the boxes had become incredibly a filled with stuff and colorful on the outside. And so you could see this lovely manifestation of these children becoming more articulate about describing those things that strengthened them. Mm. It was a discipline. Yeah. It was an approach. self-awareness. Oh, my word. Yeah. And like, who does that these days? Hudson will not have that, but he should, because he needs to be able to learn that he can use the raw material of life, the people he bumps into, the situations, the context, the languages, the, the subjects that he learns. All of these are material from which he can learn how life strengthens him and it will be different from his brothers. And that's not trivial. That's really big. So my energy gets up on this because I think I can, that was 2006. I've kept saying, I'm not going to go into the classroom because ugh, it, it's a, it's schools and it's difficult and fragmented. So it's fragmented. <laughs> yeah. And lots of people have lots of opinions, but what I can do is I can put into the world a strengths assessment that I know works. Mm -hmm. I know how to build those. And then I can create, I think what I'll do is create a foundation, which will be a credentializing body. And we'll have lots of people creating content and we'll bless them. And in so doing, I hope I change the conversation around what education should be responsible for. And if it isn't responsible for seeing the gifted uniqueness of a child, then it should be. And we're going to try and help create tools in education that will ensure in 10 years time your kid goes to school and somebody's going, the whole point of this is to figure out what's special about you. Yeah. Not to bless you and pat you on the head, but to go, no, 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 contribute through that, Hudson. Like, that's what my son, Jack, that we got to see Jack, Lilia, with her two million Instagram followers. Like, what is that about, Lilia? It's not nothing. How do you turn it into contribution? How do you turn it into a career? These well, are all what about it do you love? What yes. about what about that? Is, are you enjoying or not enjoying, yes. Marcus? I've done a terrible job of managing time completely because we haven't even talked about your second and third books. I wonder if I can just tell the, the listener about them, yeah. and you can try to give me one of your beautiful story riffs on what whether the stuff you've been talking about kind of naturally f fades into it, or if you can kind of take these two books and give me a little bit of a story and why they are formative to you. So your second book is The Soul's Code: In Search of Character and Calling by James Hillman. James Hillman lived from 1926 to 2011. He was an American psychologist, studied at, then guided studies for the uh, Carl Jung Institute in Zurich. He founded a movement towards archetypal psychology and retired into private practice, writing and traveling to lecture like, you're, like, you, got, like you do until his death at his home in Connecticut. 
unlike you. Fire this under Dewey Decimal for 150 psychology. Plato and Greeks called Plato and the Greeks called it Daemon, the Romans genius, the Christians guardian angel. Today we use the term heart, spirit, and soul. To James Hillman, the acknowledged intellectual source for Thomas More's bestselling Sensation Care of the Soul, it is the central and guiding force of his utterly compelling acorn theory, in which each life is formed by a unique image, and that image is the essence of life and calls it to a destiny, like the mighty oak's destiny is written on a tiny acorn. That I can't wait to hear you talk about as your second book. And your third book, of course, is The Sports Gene by David Epstein, published by Penguin in 2013. Black background, white text. File the 613.71 under physical fitness. This book explores the question of nature versus nurture as it pertains to training for athletes in sports, using anecdotes favoring both sides of the argument. Your books are big books. They're, they're kind of complicated, they're, you know, but they're all riffing on this idea of what makes you you, mm. what makes you the best, mm. what makes you your best self. This is naturally dovetailing with your passion, with your interest, with your work. So tell us how they, A, shaped you or are inspiring you today. So the soul's code is not a piece of research. It is clearly a piece of philosophy, mm, mm -hmm. almost of spirituality. Yeah. So I put it in there because... Uh, there's a lot of other research books I could have shoved in, but James Hillman is a poet, really. Yeah. The, like, you have three boys. You have Hudson. Do you mind saying the other names on that? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could. Yeah. I, I've actually never said their names before. It's weird. You, you're, you're, um, Making me think about why I don't do that. I think Leslie and I'm I... I'm happy not to if you don't want me to. Just they're so young. I, we yeah. don't put any of their images okay. and stuff online. Got it. Okay. But, but I, I, you are a perfect yeah. example of... You've got three boys. Mm. They're really young. You don't know how they came to be. They just came to be. They popped out and then they were all of a sudden themselves. Mm. You are looking at them born roughly around the same time in the same sort of socioeconomic environment. Yeah. I don't know, maybe whatever your career trajectory is, maybe it's getting better or worse, I don't know, but roughly the same socioeconomic context. Yeah. And you will discover really soon, if you haven't already done so, how beautifully different they are. Yes. How utterly weird they are. Yes. And um, are not weird in a bad way. Weird in a yeah. way we were talking about this I've earlier. heard your definition of weird. Well, it's not, it's not mine. Yeah. Actually, she, the, Trace, I'm, I'm pointing at Tracy here. It's an old English definition, which is a lovely one. Can you say it just for w, everybody here? Well, W-Y-R-D mm -hmm. is what daimon is. Mm. It is the old English version of daimon. Mm. It just means, and daimon means... Um, not demon, mm. it means spirit. Mm -hmm. It means what is your, your essence. Inner essence yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The idea when you have three boys like you do, you will see whether you use weird, which W Y R D I like means. Weird. Uh, John Lennon, it's weird not to be weird. Right. And weird not as in you're odd, weird as in you're unique. So it's just a little twist on. On that, everyone's weird. We or are weird. This Everyone has a weird. weird. Our listeners are weird. We love weird. Right. So when you have three boys like that, that doesn't mean that this. It's not like one is taking a fixed mindset and going versus a growth mindset. Go well, my boys are my boys are my boys. Destiny is done at zero. One isn't saying that. James Hillman isn't saying that. What Hillman is saying is something rather more beautiful. That inside each of your boys is something unique and beautiful and has some design to it. Some, it could be just the clash of the chromosomes, and then we could dive into how the brain grows and how it doesn't actually mutate into something completely different, but everybody's brain seems to be a beautifully unique synaptic network connection that will never be made in that way again by anyone ever, ever. Acorn to oak tree. Right. So everyone's got this uniqueness from birth. And then... A, there's something beautiful and respect, worthy of respect for that uniqueness. And B, that uniqueness is the beginning of contribution. So, so the destiny of your boys will be unique for them, each one of them, and will be to make a contribution through that uniqueness. That will be their entire point of being here. And ideally, you will help because you and your spouse partner will be completely curious about it yeah and will be a, a catalyst for it and that's a beautiful thing so the soul's code simply takes a whole bunch of different people and reads their life backwards which i loved as a mental framing you normally we go well he became a general in the battle of the bulge because he had to walk 12 miles yes. in the snow in kansas and all hillman does is go wait a minute no he was always going to be the battle of the bulge he if you read it backwards he had to walk the 12 miles in order to be ready for the the 12 miles walking in the snow at 12 years old wasn't 
formative. It was it was in preparedness of almost. something. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not that. Uh, that's a pretty Fate. fatalistic, Fate right? Over free will, right? And I'm not that fatalistic. I just loved how how much he pushed on the beautiful idea that each one of us has some uniqueness that is clearly physical in nature. We can see it in the synaptic connections of our brains, but also spiritual in nature in the sense that there's a, a soul, like my sister's soul's different than mine's, different than my brother's. How do we find that? Well, that's the beautiful thing about life is that whoever you believe your spiritual being to be sort of has given us a life mm -hmm. that has emotional valence. Even every, today is Monday. There is a series of actions and interactions that will happen today for you. During the course of those interactions, some of them will draw you up. Some of them will lift you up now and be emotionally positive and others will drag you down. Life shows you that and it's not random. And I'm not saying that you couldn't tweak or alter it a wee bit next week, but you're not an empty vessel. Your boys aren't empty vessels. We're all, we've all got a sort of a unique way in which we draw strength and love from life. And life shows us this. Now, do we teach our kids how to use life to help them discover these things? No, we don't. Should we do that? Yes, we should. Enter your school assessment program. Well, yes. <laughs> or is one part of it. That'd be yeah. like one thing, yeah. right? The book is simply a way that the soul's code is a way of stopping and going, it's like, have you read um, Have you read His Dark Materials? No. Oh, so that's just coming out now on, on HBO, but it's a, it's a series made from these three books by Philip Pullman. And His Dark Materials is a fantasy thing, yeah. about, like Game of Thrones, but yeah. everybody literally walks around with their diamond on their shoulder. Oh, gotcha. And they're an animal, various animals, but everyone's walking around with their diamond and everyone can see it. Yes. Everyone can see your diamond. Yes. It's kind of a, it's a lovely idea. Um, which is similar to the Souls Code. And the other thing I kind of hear baked in there, Marcus, and this kind of leads us into the sports team by David Essie, who also wrote Range, of course, and this is reminding me a little bit of The Black Swan by Nassim Taleb, is just expose yourself to as many things as possible, like Range. Be as yeah. diverse as possible, as long as possible. Black Swan, bet a chip on every number on the roulette wheel and give it a spin. Keep trying new things. There's, there's a stat that comes out and Epstein's work saying Nobel Prize winners are 22 times more likely than their scientific peers to have an unconventional, unusual, or amateur hobby wholly outside their discipline. They're blowing glass. They're starring as a ratio in the town play. They are teaching magic at birthday parties. Like, give yourself the permission to be a beginner at lots of things your whole life over and over again. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's range, which... I, <laughs> I didn't like as much as I like the sports gene because the twist on this, I would suggest is you should be exposed to as many different kinds of things as you feel an appetite for. And you should do that in order to discover yourself, mm -hmm. not in order to um, fill in what isn't there. Yeah. So if you are scavenger hunting, yes. it's because you're trying to discover the various aspects of who you are. You're not, you're not empty, where well, you're trying to become well-rounded. So as I looked at range, I felt that David had maybe moved more into the territory of narrow, bad, range, good. Mm -hmm. And that's just not true. The research doesn't back that up okay, at all. Talk to me more about that. Well, that, that is what range says. Y yes, but it, what, it, what it should be saying instead is what you said. Expose yourself in as far as you have an appetite to do so, because everyone's range, by the way, will be unique. So what does he mean by range? Because does that mean have seven hobbies like Federer? Or does that mean, have, like, let's be careful that we don't generalize about range. Your range might be super narrow. Mine might be even how we use scales when we respond to things. Some people have very tight little... Well, we're forcing things into little parameters. If, if, we're, not, if yeah. we're not careful. Yeah. We, yeah. So everybody has different range. But what you said is keep exposing yourself to different experiences yeah. and stay open to them because they will help you discover something about yourself that's interesting or important or help you make connections yeah. in your mind. It's, con it's called... Uh, it's not a new idea. It's called Consilience. In fact, there's a really good book called Consilience strongly advocating for people to get out of their academic discipline functions in order to draw connections between them, which David writes about too. Um, but the, um, the idea, I suppose, at the core of the sports gene that I loved was 
and you hit upon it right at the beginning of the show here, um, 10,000 hours, even Anders Ericsson, whose research it was, <laughs> was like, wait a minute. That presupposes that deliberate practice yes. is the mechanism be that through which mm -hmm. you get to be excellent. And what that's missing, of course, is the raw material. There is raw material. I go and go back to your three boys. You've got three really different boys who are going to practice, hopefully deliberately, at a whole variety of things. And and yet each of that each, each child will have a unique uh, set of genes, obviously, that create. Uh, unique raw material on which that practice operates. I have a younger sister who was a ballerina. I have an elder brother who is a, a beautiful composer and, and musician. My dad threw a trombone at me. Yes. For sure, because I was going to have the same sort of musical talent as my siblings did. And I... I just didn't. I just didn't have that. Yeah. And I tried. I mean, I didn't put 10,000 hours in, but probably 5,000. Yeah. And I got from like really bad to average. Now, to your point, I've heard you speak to, you know, swimming. That, try new things. Yes. Who knows what you might overcome? And yes. it gives you real agency to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and it is an and, and Neil is Neil. And there's something, if it, Nature. there's something unique about mm -hmm. you that is really coherent that we need to understand. And that doesn't mean narrowness necessarily, but it does mean that the nealness of Neil isn't enduringly malleable. Yes. That isn't true at all. Right. Epstein talks a lot about the, the actual length of the limbs of the a specific tribe of Kenyan run, runners compared to the length of the torso of people that grew up like my, Michael Phelps, making them better at, for example, running versus swimming. And you couldn't have Michael Phelps in a marathon. You couldn't have the Kenyan tribe swimming. And I thought legs. that's what was so great about mm -hmm. the sports gene, that mm -hmm. it was like, you know what, Michael Phelps, he's got really short legs and really long arms. And then the moment he said that, you go and look at you go, Oh, he does have, and that's the body of a swimmer because the legs operate like fins and, and you go, oh, now that doesn't mean that Michael Phelps shouldn't try lots of things. He should. It doesn't mean that he shouldn't practice, 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 practice because he should, but there are some things about him, by the way, some of which are not physical, some of which are the drive to compete, mm -hmm. some of which are the ability to calm We can't even nerves. measure some of these things at all, probably. Some of them probably are unmeasurable, but they are consistent recurring patterns of thought, feeling, or behavior in Michael that are unique to Michael and sort of unchangeable. Mm -hmm. So none of this is fixed mindset stuff. It's more like honor uniqueness mm, stuff. Honor uniqueness and stuff. And the reason why, and I'll shut up here in a second, but the reason why this is so bloody important and that th this is clearly a, an I think, but the reason I think this is really important is when you don't know who you are, when you think you're an empty vessel that can become anything you want to be, then you get scared and you get the reaching out for people that look like you or think like you because you don't know who you are. You think about people that might share your nationality or your religion or your gender or your political beliefs. And, and you do that because you aren't strong in yourself. You, you go, well, I'm a white male of a certain age. And, and this goes all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. You aren't a, the least interesting thing about me is that I'm a white male of a certain age, born and raised in England, then living over here in North America. I'm not saying that's irrelevant to my life experience, but, but I have somebody who also is a white male of a certain age, raised in the same house as me, same nationality as me, same friend group as me, and came out in really obvious ways, completely different. Yeah. So what's that? And if I don't own me-ness, me-ness, then I... I I get drawn into tribalism. Mm. We are seeing a lot of that in the mm -hmm. U.S. right now. If I don't know who I am, then I, I follow the crowd. I, I, I reach mm -hmm. desperately. Or the crowd can sway me. And pulls me. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, when we got first brought up to Vancouver Island for this school, they were struggling. First Nations kids particularly were struggling with truancy. They looked at the school and went, school hasn't any point for me. Why would I, go in, why would I stay in school? Because it doesn't serve me. Um, and so what this teacher was trying to do was go, wait a minute, you're not a First Nations kid. You're, you're Brian or you're Jane, and, and you have a voice that is actually, it's, it's informed by your First Nation status, but it's, it's actually, that's the, the most obvious gateway. Once we go through the gateway, you've got a magical garden in there that's all you. You have a voice, and we want this school to be instrumental in helping you to cultivate that voice. Please stay in school, because the school is helping you cultivate your voice. Okay, that's amazing. And when you do that, 
I'm not saying First Nation kid isn't, like the First Nation part is an important part of their identity. It is. But there's so many more interesting variants and aspects of that identity. And when you know what those are for you as an individual, you are stronger. Mm -hmm. You withstand the tides or the pulls of the crowd. You reach your highest potential too. And you, and you do it in a way that is making a dent in the world that only you can make, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Making a dent in the world that only you can make. Marcus Buckingham, thank you so much for coming on Three Bucks. My pleasure. It's been really fun. Everybody, it is just me. It is just Neil again, hanging out in my basement with my backpack full of wires, listening to Mr. Marcus Buckingham make a dent in three books that only he could make. If you hear some thumping, screaming, and banging, it is because my children are playing on the kitchen floor above me. Uh, or they're destroying things on the <laughs> kitchen floor above me. It sounds like all hell is broken loose, but I'm going to continue this recording. Okay. Ah, they'll be fine, right? Marcus gave us so many quotes to think about, and they include, your kids are chips you have on the poker table of your life. When you push on that, what you're doing is you're not seeing your child. You're moving your piece around the board, and that means the kid has no agency. A good reminder for all of us as parents. Do you ever say, oh, I want my kid to go to the school I went to. I want them to live there. I want... You don't want them to do anything. You want them to be who they'll be. And you'll love them no matter what. Ugh, a reminder for me. I'm talking to myself here. Number two, if I don't own meanness, then I get drawn into tribalism. And finally, a beautiful quote. The last one I'll read. When was the last time a day flew by? I love that question. It's very similar to what I call the Saturday morning test, uh, which is in the happiness equation in my book. I talk about what would you, what do you do on a Saturday morning when you have nothing to do? When was the last time a day flew by? How do you tap into the inner desires and loves that you have in your acorn inside you? Thank you so much to Mr. Marcus Buckingham for giving us number 854, An Intimate History of Humanity by Theodore Zeldin. Number 853, The Soul's Code by James Hillman. And number 852, The Sports Gene by David Epstein. It has been a pleasure. It has been a conversation. It has been a journey. Thank you so much to you for listening. And now, if you're still here... I'd like to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. This is the club where I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me. We play your voicemails. We play your letters. And we always start off by going to the phones. Hi, Neil. This is Krista from Commerce Township, Michigan. Um, thank you so much for the website. I just discovered it. And I'm now binge listening, starting with, of course, chapter one. Um, it's I love books. They've been my best friends forever. And um, I have lots of, I don't know if I could even narrow it down to three, but anyway, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated um, all your hard work and the interviews are super interesting and, a, and very different, even if I've heard from the people before. So um, thanks so much. Uh, I think the podcast is brilliant and I am continuing on. I think I'm on chapter 10 now. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much to Krista from Michigan. Hanging out in chapter 10 with the landmass star. Krista, you're off to see Carrie Colon, not see, hear Carrie Colon in Washington, D.C., and then you're over to Chris Anderson at the TED headquarters for chapter 12. I hope you're enjoying the journey and can't wait till you catch up to chapter 50. If you want to call, don't forget our number is 1 833 Read A Lot. Yes, that is a real phone number. And yes, we do listen to every single voicemail and we play some of them on the show. Okay, now it's time for the letter of the chapter. And for this chapter's letter, we're going all the way down to New Zealand. Tui Lola. Thank you for leaving this letter on the Apple Podcasts or iTunes review website. Reminder, by the way, if your letter is read, let me know and we will mail you a free signed copy of any of my books. Yes, even to New Zealand. Tui Lola writes, I found this podcast via the Knowledge Project podcast. 
Neil was a guest on Shane's podcast, and the episode was called Happy Habits. I really enjoyed hearing his thoughts and opinions, so much so that I've started to do a couple of the things he suggested, and I'm really happy for it. I searched to see if he had done any other podcasts, and I came across this one, and it must have been fate. I love reading, but I've dropped it off in my adult years for a number of reasons, primarily because, one, I don't know what to read, and it's a lot of effort to try to find something, and two, because, quote-unquote, I don't have time. This podcast addresses both of these. To say I'm happy would be a bit of an understatement. The only problem is I'm going to have to read all the books in each chapter before I can move on to the next one. Thank you so much to Tui Lola for that. Okay, and now it is time for the word of the chapter. And for this chapter's word, let's go back to Mr. Marcus Buckingham. W-Y-R-D is what daimon is. It is the old English version of daimon. It just means, and daimon means... Um, sp- not demon, it means spirit. Yes, indeed, it is daemon. D-A-E-M-O-N, a classical mythology word. Daemon is the Latin word for the ancient Greek daemon, D-A-I-M-O-N, which originally referred to a lesser deity or guiding spirit, such as the daemons of ancient Greek religion and mythology. Um... I'm smiling and laughing to myself as my kids scream and holler above me. Is that, does that add good ambience to the show? Should I be running off to check in on them? I know my lovely wife, Leslie, is upstairs, so I will check on them soon. The word diamond is derived from Proto-Indo-European daemon, which means provider, divider of fortunes or destinies, from the root da to divide. Okay, diamonds were possibly seen as the souls of men of the Golden Age, acting as tutelary tutelary deities. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, this is a word I clearly knew nothing about, and I know just a little bit more than nothing now. It is therefore featured as our word of the chapter. Okay, guys, this is it. Wrap-up time. It's been 50 now. 50 chapters. 50. 50 chapters. For some podcasts, that would be enough to fill a month. For some, it'd be far beyond what they would ever do. For us, it is 50 on the way to 333. If you are a member of the Cover to Cover Club, we will be on this journey together for 14 years. I was in my late 30s when I started this show. I'll be in my early 50s at the end. I love your love. I feel your love. I feel this connection. I know it is special. I know it is unique. I know it is rare to form invisible communities like this around the world where time and space mean nothing, but our minds are connected whenever we want them to be. Whether that's me when I'm 100 years old, whether that's you in a basement gym in a hotel in Mongolia, or driving a van in the Italian mountains, I'm feeling it. This is special, and I really appreciate you listening, your letters, your calls, your support, and your ideas as we continue this conversation. Thank you so much for listening. Remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Take care, everybody.